I think we can start. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today for what I hope will be a really uh, dynamic and interesting panel discussion. Look called Down to Earth. Um, Jean-Jacques Cousteau once said, we often forget the water cycle and the life cycle are one. While Mark Twain said, by land, they're not making it anymore. They're both correct. The less healthy land we have available, the less the water cycle can function. The more life on earth becomes precarious. So catastrophic drought and flood are very definitely linked to climate change, but also to suboptimal land use planning and management. This side event will highlight the pivotal role that land has in regulating water, reducing scarcity, and limiting surplus. We hope we're gonna bring light to some of the science and policy land-based solutions needed to reduce the impact of drought and floods on people and the ecosystems that they live in. We hope we can help make, of, make sense of some recent drought and flood events, and more importantly, the actions needed. If we act, co act collectively, land-based solutions can minimize exposure to disastrous climate change impacts. I would like to move straight into the action now, if that's okay with you. And I'm gonna start with uh, the state of the art. What do the science tell us? And then we will hear from our fabulous representatives from some of the countries. So to start with, can I ask Baron Orr, who's the lead scientist of UNCCD, to kick us off. Baron, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Louise. So my job in seven minutes is to tell you all the science about drought and flooding, which of course is not gonna be possible, but because of the names that you see on the slide, I have some of the key pieces of information that you may not be fully aware of that could help you link land, water, and climate and move forward in a more positive way with resilience to drought and with preparing for flooding. So first of all, let's, I'm a professor, so let's start with a question. Who knows the answer to this one? Can water become scarce even when rainfall remains unchanged? You have four years of steady, regular precipitation. Can you have water scarcity in your country? Absolutely yes, and here's why. When we think about drought, too often we think only about the meteorological aspects and the news often talks about that side of it. But human decisions influence what we do in the way we use land and water and manage land and water. And that moves us, the needle between water security and water scarcity. And climate also can drive on both ends of that. That's why we have six different categories of drought, because if you have the human decisions that come in, then you have the sectoral differences that must be addressed where drought is concerned in each of those sectors. But the challenge is how do we bring them together? How do we integrate across these for a holistic and, and systematic solution? So if you take away one scientific element, or actually I'm gonna give you two in a row here, you would focus on water productivity. More crop per drop, as Ratan, Ratan Lal says. If you keep this in mind in everything that you do with respect to building resilience, you can move the needle in the right direction. Of course, I'm a scientist, so you have to have at least one complex looking graph. But if you just focus on the brown curve that's far to the right, you'll realize that to address water productivity, it's all about the biology in the soil. It's about putting the organic matter back in the soil. It's about doing something that achieves multiple benefits. It, only, it not only can raise your water holding capacity significantly, it also draws carbon down from the climate and if carbon, sorry, from the atmosphere and if carbon is in the soil, the soil is alive and therefore you've got biodiversity below and above ground. So there, this means that anything that reduces water holding capacity 
and more importantly, anything that consumes more soil moisture than it should can move the needle in the direction of water scarcity. So let's flip the story to floods and ask a similar question. Are floods entirely a function of natural events? Not, not at all. They also are tied to land use and management, different aspects that are in highly influential, but nevertheless the same general story, not only in terms of frequency and magnitude of drought, but also for the storage side of things. So if we actually took a scientific approach and took all the factors that influence flooding beyond the rainfall events, it looks very, very complex. But if you zoom in, you'll realize soil is in the middle of everything, either directly in those variables or indirectly in all the others. So now let's move the story to the global side of it. Where are droughts most frequent? And if you look closely, you'll realize developing countries are definitely in the bullseye for this, although droughts occur everywhere in the world. But if we take the concept of vulnerability, we now have no question about where we're having the most concern related to drought. And with the aridity trends projected by the IPCC, this is going to only expand. If we also want to look at this from the perspective of future climate change, this is the most severe modeled by this particular author at four degrees Celsius, blue here is bad. So you have more flooding events projected in most of the world, particularly you'll notice the developing world. There have been man many major reports on drought. Uh, one was published only recently by WMO. The, this one is from UNDRR. And one of the authors, the first one, Wadid Aryan, he helped me a little bit with this presentation. The report is an extraordinary. Every one of these boxes is fully treated technically and scientifically in this report. But I draw your attention to the second column at the top. The true impacts of drought are massively underestimated on one side because the drivers, what leads to drought, are systemic across social, economic, and environmental um, systems. And on the other side, the responses are highly complex. And that means much gets left out in the assessment of costs. That's a problem because that means our policies are not in line with reality. The other aspect of policies, I only would ask you to look at the bookends in this slide. If you look at the far left, it's necessary on the governance side to ensure political authority, it's a political will side of this, and policy coherence. Aligning social, economic, and environmental policies is perhaps the most important step for all environmental issues that could be taken to create an enabling environment today in your country. On the far right, if you're from an organization, you would be surprised because almost all organizations dealing with drought and flood stop at data, at information, at sharing across that side. But we also have to get those organizations to share risk and responsibilities. To put all this together, one of the people that I worked with on this presentation, who is from Trinidad and Tobago, Sarah J. Govia, gave me the story in two slides for her country. And notice, there's nothing here about rainfall. It's about land degradation, watershed degradation, and data. That's the key elements that she felt were necessary to communicate about drought in her country. And also notice that their solutions are integrating social, environmental, and economic components. The people on the ground, the community water warriors, on the right, bringing a financial link to be able to invest in dealing with the problem through ecotourism, and of course, at the bottom, information. At the UNCCD, 
meaning the convention on land, the sister convention to the climate change convention, countries have asked the secretariat and the global mechanism to assist in moving from a reactive approach to drought, which has been predominant in most of the world for the last four or five decades, to a proactive approach. And those three categories are what we call the pillars of the drought initiative. Everything that we're doing is based on monitoring, vulnerability assessment, and mitigation measures for risk. Over 60 countries are pursuing this right now and almost completed national drought plans, having nothing on the books prior to this initiative. And the organizations, as you'll see at the bottom of the slide, are all working together. This is not UNCCD tools. These are tools from many organizations being brought together in one place so that we can support countries. At the highest level, policy level, the country parties of the UNCCD requested an intergovernmental working group, and you'll notice it's also structured on the pillars that I've mentioned, and they're very close to the point of making recommendations back to our conference of the parties, which will take place in May in Abidjan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baron. That's really brought, yeah, it's quite, he's good at that, isn't he? He's brought us up to speed there, and hopefully there's a, a kind of common understanding of where we are. Um, we know that this is an issue that's increasingly important to parties, to both UNFCCC and to UNCCD. So I think what I'd like to do now is, given what Baron has set out there, um, hand it over to some of um, our colleagues who've come from the parties and let them tell us about their experience with flooding and with drought in, in their countries. May I first start with you, ma'am? I'd like to introduce Her Excellency, Ms. Nancy Temple, who is the Minister of Forestry and Natural Resources, Energy and Mining from Malawi. To, to do, I go, do I go up there? You, you'd like to speak up at the, the okay. podium? All Certainly, right. ma'am. Okay, okay. Thanks. As you like. Madam Temple. Excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I feel greatly honored uh, to be part of this high level side event of the UNF C titled Down to Earth, making ecosystems and communities more resilient to extreme drought and floods. I come from Malawi and Malawi is a highly vulnerable country to the impacts of climate change and weather-related drought disasters. This is largely due to its landlocked location in the Rift Valley, heavy reliance on rain-fed agriculture, a rapidly growing population, and sustainable urbanization and settlement patterns, poor economic status and the environmental degradation. Malawi has had its fair share of disasters and recently we've had, we, that have led to food insecurity, increased poverty, loss of lives and property, and decline in health status, poor environmental conditions and a general decline in the quality of life and affected populations. In March, of 2019, Malawi again exp experienced one of the worst weather-related impacts, tropical cyclone Idai, which resulted in severe floods in many parts of the country. We lost um, 60 people, but a lot of people, over a million, were displaced. It was estimated that recovery and reconstruction needed to build back better announced amounted to 370 million US dollars. 
representing 5.8% of Malawi's GDP. Disaster risk management is a priority in the Malawi and development strategy with emphasis on forecasting and risk modeling to reduce risks and create safer environments for communities. While strengthening disaster risk management governance at all levels for effective response. We have a national resilience strategy which provides guidelines for breaking the cycle of food insecurity by promoting linkages between disaster, risk reduction and climate change adaptation. This strategy seeks to improve national resilience to climate change through a number of priorities such as mainstreaming disaster risk management across sectors and administrative levels, flood prevention and control, and effectively early warning systems and disaster preparedness response and recovery. We are also implementing the green, Great Green Wall as part of the UN CCD land degradation neutrality. We have the Bone Challenge, where Malawi has pledged to reforestate and restore 4.5 uh, million hectares of degraded landscapes. Every year we have the tree planting season and it starts in two weeks time where we mobilize communities to plant trees. This is to mitigate against floods but also to ensure that we restore our landscapes to prevent soil erosion. What does Malawi need? And this, I think, applies to other African countries as well. Malawi needs support to effectively implement its disaster management frameworks and programs. These frames, frameworks are designed to reduce Malawi's vulnerability to climate change related shocks and provide resilience to local communities. What is required is one, resources for climate change resilience that target the most vulnerable groups, including women, children, and the aged. Accessibility of climate refinances should be made simple so that the least developed countries can easily access resources. Emphasis on locally made and nature-based solutions and actions in addressing issues, drought, and floods, and measures to stop sexual harassment of child, child labor in providing resources to the most vulnerable. Finally, Malawi believes that this summit this event is a great opportunity for us to discuss and come up with actions that address weather-related disasters and impacts across the world. Time for action is now, and this action is by all of us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I'm, uh, before we get, and I hope we're going to be able to have time uh, for questions from the audience, so I hope you're thinking about some questions. I would like to turn now to Trevor Thompson, who is the Chief Agriculture, Chief Agriculture Officer, very good, thank you, thank you Trevor, the Chief Agriculture Officer uh, um, from Grenada. Would you like to tell us about your experience and the relationship between drought, flooding and land? Thank you so much, Trevor. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, and um, good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, delegates, team panelists, and um, ladies and gentlemen that are with us presently and also that are with us uh, virtually. I'm extremely happy to be able to uh, represent uh, Grenada um, at this panel and, and looking at this issue from, as the topic says, from a, a down-to-earth yeah. perspective. Um, and, um, and because I believe sometimes we could, we could, we could look at, at, at these issues from a strictly uh, theoretical and scientific perspective and we forget that 
uh, the real people in the communities are the ones who feel the impact of these things. And, and oftentimes our strategizing and planning doesn't really take that into consideration. So I, I'm from Grenada. It's a, it's a very small island in the Caribbean, Southern Caribbean. It's just north of, of, of Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago. It's only 120 square miles or about 78,000 acres. That's a small farm for some people. Uh, but it has about average, the population is around 100, 110,000. Um, very high rainfall compared to many parts of the world. We have average rainfall is about between 750 to 1400 millimeters. And um, on the wettest month of the year, we have two seasons, a dry season from January to, to June, and then a wet season from, from end of June to, to, de to December normally. Sometimes it changes, and with the climate variability that we are experiencing now, sometimes we don't know when is a, is a rainy season and when is a dry season. Everything is, 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 um, is chaotic. But for, for Grenadians, I, at least my age group, um, I think, and for many Caribbean people, uh, drought only became a reality in 2009-2010 when the region experienced one of its worst droughts in, in over 100 years. The impacts were devastating and far-reaching, especially to, to the people of the smaller islands where there are no rivers and streams and they depend on rainwater harvesting for their, for their survival. The drought had the attention of not just uh, the, the, I would say the low strata of the society, but the policy makers, both um, at a national level and at, and at a regional level. And um, because all of society was impacted by that drought, whether it was the policeman who had to be patrolling to ensure people were not washing their cars with, with hoses, to the farmer who um, had, to, had, to, had to be, you know, carrying water uh, to, to, to keep his, his, his livelihood, or to the child who couldn't go to school because there was no water in the schools, to the hospital that could be impacted. Um, every aspect of life was impacted. Construction had to come to a an halt. And sometimes you don't think construction uses a lot of water. So the whole economy was impacted. And in fact, the government had to reach the stage where they, where they, where they enacted, they, they, they activated special legislation to deal with the issue of managing water supply. We reached the stage where we had to, to barge water to some of the, 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 of, of the other islands of the nation that, that, that has population. So following this drought, we, we had, what we have experienced now, we, we've had very frequent, I, I call it climate variability. Um, flash flooding, unseasonal rainfall events and dry spells, which have proven to be very destructive. And along with that, we've also experienced the bushfires that come with droughts. Now, this brings me to the issue of drought and its clear linkage to the, to the tree conventions. For small island states that are most vulnerable to climate change impacts, the evidence is becoming clear that land, water, biodiversity, and environment are all interconnected. There's absolutely no way we can separate the three. And um, the impacts of drought on land and water and environment requires us to act in a holistic manner. What we realize is that the main focus of our drought response has been on water availability, and we have left the issue of its impacts on land and livelihoods and biodiversity and environment far behind. So we have started to, 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 to act on this by um, looking at policies, legislation, and also on the ground actions that, that, we, are, that we are taking as a nation so we've, we've, we have addressed the issue of water with a, a national water policy and, and, and legislation. And through that, we are establishing water resources management units. We've separated the function of water um, supply from distribution and those kinds of things. Uh, we've, we've just, in fact, uh, just a month ago, government approved a national land management policy that speaks to the issue of land not um, from zoning perspective, but from the issue of managing it as a resource. And we've also 
through funding from the UNCCD, um, developed our, our national joint management uh, plan. So um, that's the big picture. The, for us, the reality of implementation, that is where we, we see the biggest challenge. Um, we in Grenada believe that there are things we could do from our own perspective, from our own what I call capital resources that w and w the strategy we use is we integrate it into the work plans of different ministries and departments. So for example, the issue of data collection, we, we don't really require huge sums of money to, 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 to have data collected that will help us make policy decisions. That must become a normal operation of different departments and ministries across the island and including even the private sector that helps with collecting rainfall data, climate data, et cetera. They invest their own money, establish weather stations, et cetera. So it's not, it's not just a government alone striving and looking for resources. To, we must get everyone involved because everyone is impacted by these events, whether it's the hotel and tourism sector, you know, whether it's the, it's, it's the, it's the construction sector, whether it's the farmer, everybody has a part to play in this, in responding to this. Um, I'll stop here at the moment. Fantastic. I, well, I have lots of questions, but we're going to keep going, and then I hope you will have questions as well. But I really like the all of government, but all of society approach that you, you just touched on for implementation and, and getting to this implementation piece. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Monsieur Pierre Omar Udrago, de Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. Oui? Okay. On va parler en français. Et je vais faire une petite traduction après. Ça va? Je vais là-bas, je m'assois ici. Quand vous voulez. OK. Please. Alors, merci beaucoup. Euh, merci à la Convention UNCCD de nous avoir associés à, à ce débat. Thanks for inviting us. Voilà. Alors, <rire> c'est pour dire que ce que le premier intervenant a eu à, à faire comme exposé, mm -hmm sur les effets néfastes du changement climatique et beaucoup d'autres effets. C'est comme s'il était en train de dépeindre la situation de l'Afrique mm -hmm. et du Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. en particulier d'où je viens. Alors, disons que nous sommes le Burkina Faso. OK. He welcomed the earlier presentations and is now going to explain the situation in Burkina Faso. Voilà. Alors, euh, Le Burkina Faso aujourd'hui c'est 22 millions d'habitants. 22 million inhabitants in Burkina Faso. Et nous sommes dans une région qui est beaucoup plus euh, marquée par les effets de changement climatique. The region is really um, affected by climate change. Et ce qui rend en fait notre pays très vulnérable par rapport à ces chocs de changement climatique. And the, the country is very vulnerable. Qu'est-ce qui pousse notre pays à être vulnérable? Mm -hmm. C'est principalement euh, lié à quatre raisons. Four reasons for the, for the vulnerability. Euh, nous sommes dépendants des activités économiques qui sont sensibles au climat. Economic activities are really reliant on the Telles que l'agriculture pluviale, mm -hmm. l'élevage. Different types of agriculture, the fish, the There is also the fact that our system, social and ecological system, is very to face to these extreme climatic The social system, the, the society is, is not particularly strong in the face of these climate pressures. Today, we have another parameter that came aggraver les choses. Another, another parameter that came to aggravate the situation. C'est la situation sécuritaire. It's the security situation in the area. venu dégrader euh, les choses. Which has further deteriorated the situation. Parce que cela a créé environ un million de déplacés internes. It's created the, the degrading um, security situation has led to a million people being internally displaced, displaced in the country. Ce qui n'est pas sans conséquence pour euh, les crises foncières, foncières it, which has et implications for tenure regimes, access to water, ainsi de suite. And other things. Alors, 
le Burkina Faso, quand on parle aujourd'hui le thème mm -hmm. de la terre, mm -hmm. qu'est-ce que la terre pour le Burkina Faso What's the land for Burkina Faso La terre, c'est la principale source de survie It's the principal means of survival de la population for the people. et du développement économique du pays. And for development, economic development plans for the country. C'est aussi la source de revenus et d'emploi pour 85% de la population rurale. Wow, ok, and it's the source of revenue and income for 85% of the population. Voilà. Et la terre génère plus de 60% des richesses nationales. Ok. 60% in income. Malheureusement, nous avons, nous enregistrons aujourd'hui 34% des terres de production qui sont dégradées. 34, 34. 34. Ah, 34% of the land is, um, is degraded. Pour cause de, de, de l'action anthropique. Mm -hmm. So, human cause. Et puis de, de climat. And of course, climate, of course. Et cette dégradation des terres va à environ, nous pouvons l'estimer, à environ 634 000 hectares en 2020. Now, French numbers. Show me the piece of paper. I'm going to get the French numbers wrong. Show me the piece of paper. <laughs> ça, c'est impossible. C'est toujours impossible de faire ça. OK. Bon, <laughs> It's a whole bunch euh, of numbers. Celui-là. Non, non. Nous sommes où? Voilà, là. Ah! 634,000 hectares between 2010 and 2019. Thank you. Voilà. <laughs> Alors, l'expérience au Burkina Faso, l'État a essayé de, de s'engager. The state has really committed itself. Et comme engagement, nous avons, depuis l'adoption de l'accord de Paris, Since Paris. Adopter la contribution déterminée au niveau national, CDN. Yep, we've done a national determined contribution. Et nous avons pu élaborer euh, des politiques. And, and have taken on board policy changes. Et comme par exemple la neutralité en matière de dégradation des terres. So they've also adopted land degradation neutrality, which is associated with SDG 15.3 and UNCCD. Nous avons aussi essayé de fédérer plus d'acteurs et de mobiliser des ressources financières so, and bring together federated, um, partners and bring them together to pour la mise en œuvre de l'IGMVSS. Okay. So yeah. Alors, nous avons essayé aussi d'accroître le taux de récupération des terres dégradées okay, so they've started the process of restoration. de 7,65%. 7,65%. Uh, well, 65 okay. percent. percent. Very good. En 2020. En 2020. Okay, très bien. À 25 percent à l'horizon 2025. Okay, 25 percent more. Yeah. Alors, nous avons, nous allons aussi essayer d'accroître la le taux de récupération des terres, uh -huh. dégradé de euh, de réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. So it's the combination of, of building resilience for the population, but also mitigating. Uh, Environ 16,25%. Okay, 16 degrees, 16, voilà. 16%. Voilà. Wow. Alors, de Bonn, okay, so they're also signed up to the um, AFRI 100, the Bonn Challenge. Qui tend à, à la restauration des paysages forestiers africains. Okay, which is focusing at forest landscape restoration. Voilà. Alors, je vais passer outre les outils, d'autres outils que le gouvernement a mis en, en place. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour inverser cette tendance de dégradation? OK, so what can we do to turn around this, voilà. this tendency towards degradation? Il faut donc pour nous appuyer les initiatives locales. So support local initiatives. Pour les jeunes et les femmes. For particularly for dans la récupération des terres dégradées. Il faut développer les chaînes de valeur. Looking really at value chains. Les activités génératrices de revenus. Things that actually generate revenue. Il faut aussi essayer de faire la promotion des bonnes pratiques agricoles. And also promote good agricultural practices. Et nous, en tant que société civile, nous, nous essayons d'accroître les actions de plaidoyer d'interpellation. 
the, also the role for advocacy. Auprès des décideurs politiques. Actually, for domestic policy makers. Voilà. En faveur de prise en compte des initiatives, euh, l'appui des initiatives locales. So that there's support nationally for, for initiatives. Alors, nous essayons aussi de demander l'implication de la population and really get the population engaged and implicated in what's going on. Dans la formulation des politiques publiques. Actually, in, pol in public policy development. Pour la mise en œuvre euh, des projets et programmes. So to help with projects and program implementation. En plus, la mobilisation financière que nous faisons. And financial mobilization. Voilà. Alors, au Burkina Faso, nous avons une société civile qui est très forte. Burkina Faso, um, civil society is apparently very strong. Et qui est structurée autour des fêtières, des collectifs. Okay, collectively organized. Yeah. Comme le SPONG, là où je viens. Mm -hmm. Et le SPONG, c'est 277 ONG et associations. Okay, it's a huge number of associations are part of this. Et, et nous incitons, en fait, à la pratique de la gouvernance foncière inclusive. A lot to do with it, um, land tenure governance. Et nous participons aussi à la mobilisation des ressources financières au profit des petits producteurs, to support local producers, des small femmes local et des jeunes, mm -hmm. pour la mise en, en place des programmes. Ok, fantastique. Voilà. Fantastic. Alors, il y a deux exemples que je voulais prendre. Uh -huh. two, ex deux ex two examples. Euh, dans un projet, les communautés revêtissent le Sahel. Ok, in a project in the Sahel, yeah. Voilà. Community greening the Sahel. Yeah. Nous avons réussi dans trois pays. So funding in three countries. Depuis euh, 2019. Since 2019. A récupéré environ 78 000 hectares. 78, encore 70 000. Wow. 78,000. Voilà. 78,000 hectares in three countries in the Sahel they've uh, restored and rehabilitated. C'est un programme qui est piloté par Boffens. Uh -huh. It's Boffens. Boffens. C'est une ONG néerlandaise. Ah, it's a, apparently it's a... Oh, both ends. I know them. It's a Netherlands NGO that's been piloting voilà. this work with them. Et ce programme s'étend sur le Burkina, le Niger et le Sénégal. So it's Burkina, Niger and Senegal. Et nous avons aussi, à travers donc la régénération naturelle assistée. Ok, help with farmer managed natural regeneration. C'est une technique d'agroforesterie. It's a really interesting agroforestry technique. Que nous essayons de promouvoir. That they're trying to promote. Et nous avons euh, essayé de <laughs> former 28 000 Honestly. agriculteurs. <laughs> ok, oh, 28,000, oh, they've been training 28,000 voilà, small farmer. farmers. Fantastic, yeah. mm. wonderful. Alors, euh, on, laisse, a, on laisse ça là, on mm. revient pour les questions. Okay. C'est possible mm -hmm. Oui C'est bon. Que, ouais? Oui, oui c'est tout. Ok, on mm -hmm. revient. C'est très intéressant. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn now, if I can, um, to Pakistan. Yes Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. This is Mr. Ifan Tariq. No. Oh, no, it's not. It's Mr. Mohammed, yeah? Yeah. Ok, this yeah. is Mr. Mohammed Arif Goher. It's a pleasure yeah. to meet you, sir, from, from the Ministry of Climate Change in Pakistan. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates and participants, good afternoon. Uh, I am Arif Gohir. I'm a scientist uh, at uh, Global Change Impact Studies Center, which is a dedicated research institute for climate change studies in Pakistan and works as the research arm of the Ministry of Climate Change Government of Pakistan. Uh, actually, our Director of Environment, Mr. Irfan Tariq, uh, was scheduled to be here, but due to his, his some other activities, he couldn't, couldn't come. So I will present before you the case of Pakistan. So my intervention will be on three aspects. Number one, I will be talking about the state of play in, the, in regarding to uh, climatology and uh, impacts on the, uh, on the country and the society. Secondly, I will be talking about the integration of the policies and the actions the government is taking, and then some of the uh, initiatives the present government has taken uh, to curb this uh, uh, water and drought-related issues in the country. 
basically, Pakistan has a diverse climatology. 80% of the area is under arid to semi-arid conditions. Uh, overall area is 79 million hectare out of that 68 million hectare is the area where the ad ad average rainfall is less than 300 millimeters. So around 20% of the area is under agriculture, 5% area presently is under forestry, 27% is under rangelands, around 12% is under deserts, and then we have also facing the menaces of water logging, salinity, uh, so 1 to 2% area is, is uh, faced by the, these, these sort of things. Uh, on one side of the country, we have the high mountains like Karakoram, Himalayas, and Kohe Hindukash, which are 8,000 meters high. And then on the other side, we have deserts, and we are also bordered by the sea. So uh, due to the climate, where due to rising temperature, where our glaciers are melting, similarly, uh, on, uh, in the southern side of Pakistan, we have high temperatures uh, exceeding to the levels where uh, there doesn't remain the livable conditions in some of the areas. Definitely these conditions have impact on uh, water resources, or agriculture, on human health, on food security, and all these things. Uh, if we talk about the future projections of the climate change, uh, due to its topography and diversified climatic conditions, if as per IPCC climate change scenarios, the world uh, global temperature by the end of the century, if unfortunately it will reach 4.2, then Pakistan will be at almost one degree higher than the global average, which will be having the massive impacts on our the glaciers in terms of melting on the food security where it is estimated that around 20 to 25 percent yield reduction in cereal crops, crops, wheat and rice by the end of this. Uh, so, so these are some of the state of affairs. Uh, but the government is keenly uh, watching uh, these things, and it has designed some policies. We have some, uh, we have national climate change policy followed by a framework for the implementation of climate change policy. Then we have prepared the national water policy and national agriculture policy. The aspect of droughts and uh, floods are properly integrated in all these policies. Uh, to monitor that, we have a prime minister committee on climate change, which takes into account these considerations. The present government has taken mega initiatives. Uh, you might have heard of the 10 billion tree tsunami. Uh, over a period of five years, we will be planting uh, 10 billion trees, around 2 billion trees have already been planted. Then, uh, due to the shift in monsoon and scarcity of water, uh, the farmers are digging more groundwater. This is another concern. Pakistan has initiated a mega project which is called as Recharge Pakistan, under which the uh, water that is available in the form of the rain, instead of flooding it into the sea, uh, it will be uh, the area, the soils will be recharged. So this is another aspect uh, that the Pakistan has done. Uh, in order to tackle the strategy of uh, tackling the floods uh, and flash floods, uh, we have a group of two projects, Glacier Lake Outburst Floods with the UNDP under which the communities are, are trained. The, the whole process is inclusive. Early warning systems are being installed over there. Uh, in the end, I am very much thankful to the organizers again for organizing this event, and I do hope that with mutual uh, coordination and collaboration, we will uh, reach out at, a, at certain points that will be mutually helpful to all of the countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then our last, uh, from, from the countries, last but certainly not least, Jose Gonzalez from Honduras. Honduras. Would you like to give us a little bit of uh, your experience in Honduras about land, climate, water nexus? Okay. And now, um, uh, in our country, we have two stages. And 
in two scenarios every year. We have eight, seven and eight months every year uh, that uh, drought. And for four months with, uh, we have rain, but both of them, uh, there are hurricane season. Uh, the last year we, ha we received, re we received uh, two hur hurricanes in 10, year, in 10, in 10 days. Uh, we have a, a, lo a lot of um, damage, and, um, but we can focus on, in our response. Uh, this, uh, this is the common, the normal scenario for our country in, in, in our uh, country neighborhood. We have around 73 municipalities with uh, every, every year, every year they fight with the draw and uh, the, our response is um, we have a long-term plan uh, is an action, a national action uh, the fight with the, the desertification and, and, and draw and a national plan to reduce the threat for draw. But we focus in, in our statistic from our ministry, uh, finance uh, minister, ministry, uh, that damage codes for economy in Honduras, two billion dollars a year, not for develop, not for adaptation, just a response. We spend 20% of the, our budget every year just for a response, a dramatical season in, 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 in both scenarios. The, that, in that budget, we receive only uh, 0.02%. Uh, from cooperation, international cooperation, we pay the damage that we don't produce, we don't provoke. We receive the damage and we pay every year just to repair. We do, we, we, every, every year we, we need to rebuild the roads, the schools, hospitals, and uh, different uh, institutional building and a lot of ho house uh, in, the, in the communities, in the municipalities, in, in, in some municipality we have 37% the, the population who need to immigrate another city into the country or another country. It increasing every year. We have um, our response. We, in, the, in that moment, we have a story for 19 dam, the multiple use uh, energy, uh, water for irrigation and, and uh, water for consumption. Another project with the World Bank is a uh, hydro security for $85 million. And another in, in uh, recent, before, before the COP, we received the new, the, new, the good news the uh, GCF approved our project, regional project, for 270 million dollar to work in the dry corridor. And uh, 
we, uh, we, we in, in that moment, to uh, have uh, the, the new dam in the south area in Honduras, is the Pacific area, is very, very dry. It's my, it's my town. It's, I, I come from uh, 41 degree every day. <laughs> It's very hot, my, my, my town. Um, in, in we have um, another small, a small project from GCF, but the, all this uh, uh, amount of the, 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 the spend the money is uh, the cooperation, the international cooperation, but the, 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 the big portion we pay uh, the, that part uh, with the uh, uh, tax pay for the people in, in Honduras. Uh, the next step, uh, we need some guarantee uh, to equitative in enough inversion, public inversion, in our countries, we have more, more, more vulnerability and uh, uh, we need to review the letter, the, the small letter in, in, uh, in, in different agreement because it's not fair. Uh, the, the small countries pay a, lo a lot of money for damage who um, produce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, we have, I, I'm going to actually turn to Her Excellency now and ask a question about intersectoral work and whether how we go beyond um, just, we, we talk a lot in the ministries of environment, I suppose, and maybe even the ministries of climate, but how we put all of the um, sectors and parts of society together in this regard. So, Minister, may I turn to you and, and ask you for your thoughts on that? Is it, is, do you think it's possible that we are more intersectoral in the way that we work? Possible, because uh, in Malawi we have a, a committee that comprises of all the ministries. So these are issues that are cross-cutting across several ministries and we have uh, a steering committee uh, on environmental issues and in there you find the Ministry of Agriculture, you find the Ministry of Meteorical, Meteorological Services, Environment, you have water, you have land. Uh, this is intended to ensure that because these issues are cross-cutting and every ministry, if there's a disaster, all these ministries will be involved. So you're already handling these issues at that level uh, in one go. So you have meetings going on from time to time because realizing the situation that we are in. So yes, it, is, it can be done and it is being done. Great. Yes. And we've, see, we've heard quite a lot about um, the reaction to a disaster. What do we think about the move to more preparedness for drought and flood disaster? Do you see that land plays a role in that? Do you think it will manage the disasters more? Maybe again, Minister, and then perhaps other men, people from the panel? And then if there are any questions from the, from the floor, there are microphones here if, if you would like to ask a question. So, do we, do we see? If there is a disaster, for instance, uh, last year we had, uh, you know, the, there's disasters coming from, t happening from time to time because of uh, the uh, deforestation. So you have uh, floods all the time. So our ministry, uh, which is, also the ministry responsible for the environment, but also the ministry responsible for water. We work very closely with the Department of Disaster Preparedness. To be more proactive. Yeah, uh -huh. so we shall we will design, for instance, we have uh, uh, designed and constructed uh, water dikes. Uh -huh. uh, and this is done in, in conjunction with the uh, Depart Department of uh, Disasters. We now have installed, uh, uh, early warning systems, mm. yeah, so that people know uh, when, th when things, there's going to be a disaster. 
Great. So we, 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 with our ministry and the department, we issue out early warning systems, and the Ministry of Agriculture will get hold of those early warnings. The Ministry of Lands, they all will do their, part, their bit to ensure that they are taken into account in their programming. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trevor, did you? Well, I think it's, it's the same for us. We, we, um, we realize that um, working in silos is not benefiting our people and, and, and even, even the ministry itself and, and the departments. So, um, for example, when we, we just completed um, establishing a, a hydrometric network and it was a, com a comprehensive collaborative effort between the Met Services, the Water Authority, and the Ministry of Agriculture, along with, 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 um, with Ministry of Finance, um, Minister of Physical Planning Unit, Forestry Department. So we have an overall uh, technical committee that, that, that sits and, 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 and look at those, those issues and, and then look at how to address it. Otherwise, um, if we work in silos, then we get very, very little done. Um, the issue of, of, of climate smart agriculture addressing some of those issues is, is, is extremely important. And then the whole issue of, um, of upland watershed management, we realize is, is if we don't address the issue in the upland watershed areas, then obviously we will feel the impact in the lowlands. And Grenada is only 10% only of the island is flat. So, so um, when the rain fall, it falls. You know, in, in, in less than an hour, it's in the sea. Yeah. So unless we, 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 we respond in a robust manner, and not just with um, mechanical responses, but we are looking at losing a lot of um, localized, uh, using um, grasses and shrubs, etc. local indigenous uh, planting material to, to, to help with soil stability and those kinds of things. Otherwise, um, we, we just can't the bill to, to do to do um, mechanical uh, measures is, is just is just too much. So we must use um, um, soft methods. We call them with with with, with, with grasses and, and shrubs and, and new terracing and, and new planting 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 material, uh, so that um, we could we could respond to those to those um, both floods and, and drought. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come to to. Um Mohammed, actually, as well, that your tree tsunami. Do you see this land, this landscape management, as part of drought management in Pakistan as well? What, it, it, will that be one of the benefits of the of the tsunami? Yeah, we have. Uh, uh, you can say we are harvesting the benefits of tsunami. Uh, prior to this project, there was a pilot project uh, during 2013 till 2018. Uh, one billion trees were planting, planted in one province of Pakistan that is all called as Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa province. Here we see the temperature, there is a slight decrease in the overall temperature in that very particular area. Then uh, keep on keeping on the topography of the Pakistan, uh, this plantation is all across Pakistan. So it's even in the desert areas and those native species have been selected which require less amount of water. And we are hopeful that the desertification process will be lower, there will be soil cover over there, and we are hopeful that in this way that there the soil uh, organic activities will be there and the soil will be intact. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, one, one more thing yeah. I want to He's add regarding, uh, as the professor said, that uh, uh, proactive versus reactive approach. Yeah. Until a few years back, we were having the reactive approach. We have National Disaster Management Authority. So whenever there was a calamity, this department worked, and then we defined its work by developing a UN and strategic coordination forum, which uh, involved different sectors. And in the last couple of years, we have developed a national disaster risk management fund. That is a proactive approach and aligns researchers and actioners, action players, so for concocted action for pre-disaster activities. Perfect. Fantastic. I'm going to shortly turn to um, Torgen Holgren. I'm going to get that wrong. Um, in, a, in a minute, just any final words from, from Jose or Pierre, Omar? Any final additions from you guys? Yeah, and, and, and uh, an, another problem we, uh, we, we have 
to, re to recover the, 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 our forest is um, pests and disease who in, in, that increase with the climate change, with the high temperature, before the hurricane, we receive the, the pests, the, the, um, the little barrier, the, the, pi the pinus, the, 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 and we lost 600,000 six, hectares mm. in two years. Mm-hmm. It makes us even more vulnerable. I think we're really in the stage where, and this is probably my job actually, <laughs> oops, um, but I'm from the global mechanism of UNCCD and we're trying to help the countries get the projects together and, and make sure that we break through those silos so that the projects on the ground are delivering in all three areas. And I think there's still a long way to go on that, but I, I look forward to working with you as we, as we try to drive forward that proactive kind of land water nexus agenda I think it's it's vital for everybody um, yes. ça va yes. dernier mot oh, dernier mot dernier mot maintenant on a quelqu'un d'autre okay. qui va parler alors euh, au Burkina nous nous ne faisons pas euh, d'étiquette par rapport aux acteurs mm -hmm. euh, Nous avons des cadres où euh, nous pouvons travailler ensemble. We have a style of working all together. Il y a un acteur aussi qui est important, ce sont les collectivités locales. So local collectives, local groups. Et toutes les portes d'entrée des interventions doivent être basées au niveau des collectivités locales. Okay, and, the, and all of our kind of entries have got to take that reality into the ground. Et yeah. au-delà au de ça, nous, nous jouons notre rôle La société civile. And civil society plays its role. D'être aux côtés des populations vulnérables. And civil society is going to be by the side of vulnerable people and plays its role on the side of vulnerable voilà. people. Mm. Merci. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those fascinating interventions. Um, so kind of, I'm going to turn now to Torgrin Holgren, who's going to, I've got that wrong again, didn't I? But you can tell me how I'm going to say that right and I'll practice, but I promise. We are going to hear now a kind of, about kind of future directions in this and the sort of a new urgency for integrated land, water and climate action. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you and thank you for organizing this very important event and I have learned a lot during this first hour and I think there is no doubt that we are starting to see a very important uh, shift in how we view resilience and also uh, resilience also using more the natural world, nature-based solutions which makes it possible to develop new and more effective solutions for the future. I will now like to share four examples of actions that we believe we should and could take, and I will get them one by one. And my first is uh, work with nature to build resilience. We know that global warming is um, already drastically increasing the severity and frequency of climate-related disasters. We heard that during this discussion, and that is only the beginning. Things will get worse. We know that some 90% of all extreme events, extreme weather events, are water related, like droughts, floods, and tropical storms. And according to the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, droughts have increased by 29% over the last two decades and risking, according to a new report released recently, to become the new pandemic uh, in the world while flood-related disasters increased by some 134% over the last two decades. But somehow we still often fail to connect the dots. We forget that many climate-related disasters could actually be presented, prevented, sorry, prevented, or at least made much less harmful if we improved how we manage water. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time that we learn our lesson and uh, make water management a top uh, priority in the next few years. And one great way to do this is by working with and not against nature. And there are certainly many promising examples from that around the world. And we heard that earlier in this discussion. Take, for example, what we heard from colleagues here, growing uh, uh, trees and also when we see the growing cities that integrate wetlands as a way to buffer against floods uh, 
the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands has a city accreditation with noteworthy examples to be inspired by, I believe. And wetlands are a fantastic ally in, the, in, in our, uh, our cause of climate change. Help us both tackle floods or flooding and cut greenhouse gas emissions. And in that process, they also clean water, improve groundwater, recharge, and make cities more attractive. Similarly, many farmers around the world need more water smart practices. For example, agroforestry, no-till farming, rainwater harvesting, and more efficient irrigation schemes. And many of these processes also reduce the impact of uh, dry spells and boost carbon storage and also improve soil health. But these new approaches are not always available to all the farmers that need them most. Um, at my organization, we work, for instance, with a number of farmers in Africa to make more use of rainwater harvesting as uh, there is water around the world, uh, around the year, but coming in quite a few occasions, but if you can store water, then you can also have a grow planting season all the year round. That leads me to my second uh, proposal, channel investments to low-income countries. Okay, there we are, channel investments to low-income countries. It is somewhat surprising still that nature-based solutions do not attract more investment finance than they do. Um, they have an amazing ability to address many problems at the same time. Water, climate, biodiversity, poverty. And according to one study, nature might be able to help with one third of the greenhouse gas reductions um, needed by 2030. And the Global Commission on Adaptation have found that nature-based solutions be very cost efficient. And the return on investment ratio is as large as three to one if countries prioritize water-related strategic areas to build resilience. But so far, very limited uh, finance have been channeled towards this, and low-income countries are the least likely to get the necessary investments. And I think we have a challenge that needs to be changed to avoid uh, pushing vulnerable countries into a poverty trap. Because there is no lack of uh, liquidity in the world. I think what we have to do to make nature-based solutions more attractive for financiers and investors. Number three, apply a systems approach from source to sea. Uh, healthy landscapes are an insurance that we all need to have, but achieving this is made unnecessarily difficult because of the way that we think about and relate to landscapes. From young age, uh, we get used to thinking of land and water as two completely separate entities and we seldom take note of the connection between humans and ecosystems. Landscapes, I think, generally to a large extent also viewed as a nice backdrop, uh, uh, not taking into account the true value of, uh, of, for our climate and survival. And this is also reflected in the siloed approach uh, to nature, where we are used to only focus on our own specific area of expertise, be that water, forests, uh, ocean, cities or oceans. This fragmented thinking is hindering us um, uh, from uh, applying the most effective and uh, climate and resilient solutions that already exist. At CIVI, we work uh, intensely on developing alternatives, and one of them is the source to see approach that I just mentioned, that, uh, meaning that we look at a holistic approach from upstream to, to downstream, uh, from uh, freshwater, coast and the ocean, and landscape, uh, land-based activities um, to identify climate action that benefits the system as a whole. Uh, this is critical if we are to realize the full potential of nature's role in uh, climate mitigation as well as adaptation. That leads me to my final point, which is, uh, yeah, listen to the science. Uh, the scientific understanding of the natural world is fast evolving. We know nowadays have much better understanding of many complex interlinkages than we had just a few years ago. And we must use this also in policy making, especially to tackle climate change. Um, earlier this week, I together with Professor Johan Rockström and some others also issued an op-ed in the main daily newspaper in Sweden addressing this. We express our concern that policy makers are not on top of new research especially when it comes to the role of nature and climate change. 
And this is, of course, not to say that scientists already have all the answers. I think that is what science is all about, to find new answers. But our institutions are therefore together, CV, the Potsdam Institute, UNDP, and the Stockholm Resilience Center together with the German GIZ, conducting a joint research to better understand the role of water in climate mitigation. This is an area that until now has received very relatively little interest. Finally, we uh, could be entering into a new era of opportunity where we find much more effective climate solutions by working together with, not against nature. So in short, more natural-based investment and less concrete walls. Thank you. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Mr. Holgram. Um, I have got the difficult task of summarizing now, so that's good. I'm going to try my best to summarize what we heard today. Um, more nature, fewer silos working together. Um, it's not really an option anymore that we do this separately. We have to think about doing this together and we have to think about doing this effectively. There are are resources out there but they're not enough and so we need to make them work as efficiently as we can. Um, some things I heard, I heard the impact of land management decisions are going to have an implication for your water cycle. So think about that as we're making those decisions, think about those collectively. In particular think about how the soils are managed. Um, a more proactive approach to drought and flood planning and a more proactive approach to drought risk management uh, and flood risk management, empowering local land users and making sure there's cross-sectoral solutions and ensuring that we, we accompany the most vulnerable people. Um, information and science, making sure that our decisions are smart and they're based on relevant and timely information. Um, and I guess the finance question, the finance question where we're looking at conventional more finance and innovative finance solutions because the costs really are mounting and how we can uh, collectively work to deliver the land climate water nexus as efficiently and effectively as we can. Um, the conversations out there are obviously, um, are obviously heating up now and the debates are heating up. At UNCCD, we are absolutely committed to working with all the parties and working with the parties to UNFCCC to try to bridge these gaps and we look forward to future collaboration and working with you. I don't know if any of the panelists had any fun, we have got two minutes. If any of the panelists had anything they want to say, any, anybody from the audience, but we look forward to working with you on drought, and on land and on nature-based solutions, which are a critical part of the response to the, to the climate threat. Thank you so much for your participation and being here today. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to the panelists. <laughs>